The following is an excerpt of a presentation done by attorney Dennis Block from the law firm of Dennis Block and Associates regarding a property owner's legislative update for Los Angeles. The presentation was hosted by the Apartment Owners Association of California a few days ago in Long Beach. For more information on the Apartment Owners Association of California, go to AOAUSA.com. There you'll find links to their Facebook and YouTube pages and also more of their live stream seminars that they do weekly. The Apartment Owners Association of California is also one of the best resources if you're looking into screening your tenants or getting access to rental applications and lease agreements for your units here in California. This episode is not sponsored or endorsed by the Apartment Owners Association of California. They just impart very important information that I came across that I know that my audience will greatly appreciate. You're listening to The Andre Segovia Show. Hi, this is Jeff Fowler with the Apartment Owners Association, and uh, today we have a recording of a in-person seminar that we did yesterday in Long Beach, and there have been so many changes the last couple weeks here with the LA County eviction moratorium extending, with the LA City eviction moratorium ending, um, and I say that in general terms because there's lots of complexities. And so we wanted to give you an update. We had a video that we posted last week. It's already outdated. And so here we go today. We're going to post this one. And I don't know how long it will be good, but we're going to give it a shot and give you as much information as possible. And um, yeah, so with all of that said, uh, even what we did yesterday, there was one update for today. And that's that if you are serving a three-day notice, it wasn't mentioned, but if you are serving a three-day no three notice to pay rent or quit, then you would need to copy that notice and also send it to the housing department. And we are going to include some uh, slides from the housing department. There's some key uh, information in there that you're going to want. We're going to have a couple other links at the bottom as well. And we just want to keep you in the know. And so definitely take a look at this before you do anything and then definitely talk to an attorney. And so this is general information. This is not legal advice for you. So hopefully you can take this general information and make decisions for yourself. And so the speaker today if, if you don't know, he has uh, been in the business for 45 years, over 45 years. He's done over 250,000 evictions. He has uh, 25 attorneys on his staff, and he's a, uh, he writes an article for the AOA magazine every month. It's called The Legal Q&A. He has one that's specific to Orange County and one that's specific to the L.A. County, and um, he's also a uh, L, the Million Dollar Trade Show favorite. And so uh, here we go. It's, it's Dennis Block, and he's going to share with you some valuable information. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And actually, we should give a big uh, hand for Jeff for putting these on at the AOA's expense. And, I mean, really, what a great way to learn about our industry and how we're getting uh, robbed and raped and uh, <laughs> destroyed. And I'm here to bring all that good news and cheer to you. But maybe just that we'll be able to navigate uh, through this, uh, these uh, quicksand that the politicians have created for us. Uh, it's, um, it never ceases to amaze me, you know, when I first started doing these cases back in 1977, uh, you know, you would show up to court if the tenant contested. Most of the time they didn't. And if you went through an eviction, you, most of it would just be uncontested. Nobody went to court. The papers went to court. And you'd uh, schedule the sheriff, and the sheriff would be there like within six, seven days, and everything would be pretty good. And we were, quite frankly, bitching about it then. Uh, the uh, court costs on the case, I think back in 1977, including the filing fee, process serving fee, the sheriff fee, the writ fee, I think it was maybe a total of $32. <laughs> uh, 
Right now, ladies and gentlemen, it's $685. And that's assuming it's just the standard case. So uh, they're getting a lot more money, the courts and the sheriffs, and we're getting nothing for it, quite frankly, with the, uh, with the delays. Uh, in San Diego, I don't know if anybody has any property there, but that's the worst. Uh, three, four months uh, and for just to file a default. And so I, I don't know what these people are doing with our money. Uh, before we get to the topic of, the latest topic of our uh, politicians screwing every income property owner on the planet, certainly in uh, California, more specifically in Southern California, I wanted to go over some recent changes in the law uh, on that. Uh, and again, if you don't know, my name is Dennis Block, and I have cards up here if you need them. We have a toll-free number that's kind of easy to remember. It's 1-800-77-EVICT. And if you call my office, you're going to get to speak to an attorney. You might have to wait a little bit, but you are going to speak to an attorney, and we answer questions at no charge, whether you're an existing client, past client, or no client at all. We're happy to do that for you, uh, and then we'll tell you how much trouble you're in uh, or not in or how to get out of it. Um, and so we do pride ourselves in staying up with the laws that are not changing uh, week to week. They're not changing day to day. They're changing minute to minute, uh, including that I was literally at the office this morning and I got there at 4.30 uh, and uh, I, get, I get to the office early. And literally going over the law that the city council had just addressed yesterday for the city of Los Angeles. So we are up on the law. I think what I'm going to tell you today is the law. I don't think it's going to change, but I've said that before and been wrong. But I think what you're going to get today is exactly what you need to do for your property, uh, including if you want to lynch your tenant. We have ways of doing that as well. <laughs> I kid you not. Okay, so let's talk about some of the, um, the new developments, uh, things you need to know. And that is uh, rent control is a cancer. There is no industry in the entire United States where that industry is told that there's a uh, rent or price limitations on what you can charge for your goods and services is nothing. You can charge what you want if you're a real estate broker. You can charge a 40% commission. You wouldn't get any business, right? You can charge what you want if you want to sell a car, right? There's only one industry in the entire United States that has price controls, and that would be our industry. And our industry actually is the largest industry of all industries, and don't let anybody tell you that their industry is bigger. I don't care what we're talking about, from science and technology to manufacturing cars, it's our industry. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is walk outside this building and look to the left or the right, and you'll see income property. And wherever you are in the United States, you're gonna see income property, and somebody owns that property, and therefore, I declare that our industry is the largest, but that's the only one that is being controlled through something called rent control. Rent control, as I mentioned, is a cancer. And as cancer invades your body, it does one thing, it spreads. So where are the new places that have rent control? Well, we all knew Los Angeles, including San Pedro, uh, but, um, or Santa Monica or West Hollywood. But now we've got places, new places called Pomona, Bell Gardens, Pasadena, that was on the ballot and it passed. It was Proposition M on the Pasadena. Glendale has rent control. Culver City has rent control. These are new places where the local uh, municipalities have instituted their own rent control, okay? Now, a lot of times people will say that, uh, well, my property's in Redondo Beach, so, I'm not under rent control. Well, I have to tell you, 
Every city in the entire state of California has rent control, every single city. So don't tell me yours doesn't. It might not have a local jurisdiction like Los Angeles, but what it does have is statewide rent control. You know, and if you might remember, this was a couple of years ago. It was on the ballot where there should be statewide rent control. And I know uh, myself and the Apartment Owners Association, we traveled up and down the state preaching against this because uh, it was going to be on the ballot. Statewide rent control. And we defeated it not by a little bit. It was two thirds to one third because we got all the homeowners on our side. And among other people, it wasn't just the disassociation or my efforts, it was a concerted effort even by real estate groups, the Realtor Association, et cetera. And we defeated that, and there wasn't statewide rent control. Two thirds to one third, the voice of the people of California spoke. And then the next year, the state legislature put in statewide rent control. So they didn't care. They didn't care what the populace, so every place in California has statewide rent control unless it is exempt, and I'm gonna get into that. So I did wanna make you aware of the localities, the local jurisdictions that now have rent control in, in addition to the ones that you already know. Um, rent increases. If you have the right to raise rent, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, if you're raising rent 10% or less, it's a 30-day notice. If you have the right to raise rent in excess of 10%, it is a 90-day notice, everybody knows. It's not a 60, if you have any 60-day notices to raise rent, throw them out, because that doesn't exist in the state of California. Uh, so just going over a few little bullet points before we get to that dastardly uh, moratorium uh, issue. So, in the past, I've always advised clients, I don't suggest taking a Section 8 applicant as a tenant. I've always said that because you have to go through their screening procedures and their inspection procedures, and in terms of getting a rent increase, uh, even if the local jurisdiction says you can, you have to go through them, and if they say no, you don't get it. And also, usually the condition of the premises for Section 8 tenants, I don't know why, seem to be worse when they leave versus other tenants. Uh, and also, if the, they have, Section 8 has inspections, as you know, and if the tenant doesn't open up the door, then that means you fail the inspection, and that means they stop paying you rent. Well, what the hell's going on there? I didn't do anything wrong, but it doesn't matter who did something wrong, they're not. So I've always advised my clients, you know what? I wouldn't take a Section 8 tenant. Now, I've got plenty of clients that do, and they think it's a wonderful business model, and they're obviously smarter than me because they probably have more property than me. So, but that's always been my advice. Well, take my advice and throw it out the window because unless you want to get sued right now, if a person comes to you with a um, Section 8 um, voucher, you can't just say, oh, I listened to Dennis Block and I'm not taking any Section 8. <laughs> and then they would say, oh, you know Dennis Block? Okay, I'll find another place. No, but uh, so you can't say that. So you're gonna have to figure out another way not to take them if you don't. I mean, maybe uh, you can check their credit. Obviously, if their credit is bad, then you don't have to accept it. It has nothing to do with Section 8. But you just can't deny, hey, I don't take that. Take the application and run the uh, credit check. Uh, I did have, this is a couple of seminars ago, someone in the audience gave me a wonderful suggestion. See, we all learn from each other. And by the way, if you guys got questions, you can stop me and raise your hand. We'll just do it right here because for smaller groups, it's good to do questions while we're talking. And by the way, if anybody needs my card, it's on that table there. Um, so a, this suggestion came from somebody in the audience, and I haven't checked it out personally, but I do think it's correct. And that is, if you don't want a Section 8 tenant, uh, just tell them that uh, you're only renting on a month-to-month -month basis. Was that you who told me that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you know that to be the fact. So. Um, so Section 8 will not take it unless it's a one-year lease. So they'll reject you. Oh, please take it. 
please, but no. So um, if you tell them that you only want to do it on a month-to-month -month basis, then uh, Section 8 will reject you. Now, I'm going to get to this part in, the, in this discussion here today where I'm going to tell you from now on, and I've always recommended having a one-year lease for my entire existence, from now on, just rent out month-to-month. I'll get into the reasons why, but from now on, month to month only. If you have, um, what are the reasons well, we're going to get into it. Okay. I'm just giving, giving you that now, but I, but I brought that up because we're talking about Section 8, and if you want to get out of Section 8, check their credit and or only offer month to month, but I'm telling you to do month to month for everybody, okay? Um, don't forget when you do the when you do enter into a new rental agreement, uh, even if it's an uh, existing tenant and they're signing a new rental agreement or a new tenant coming in, make sure that um, you use the AOA forms. They're the best. They have everything that you need, so you don't get sued. I helped a little bit in authoring those, uh, and make sure that it has the bed bug addendum. And it has the flood disclosure, because we all know that we're all in flood zones here, right? We see the floods coming on a daily basis, but notwithstanding that, you have to have the flood disclosure and the bed bug addendum to everything. Uh, next new point uh, that I want to talk about is that make sure that if you are going to serve a three-day notice to pay rent or a three-day notice to perform or quit, that you um, use the AOA forms. They have changed dramatically, and if you don't have the right language in these forms, uh, then you get the court and you lose automatically. So, for example, the newest addition to the form, and this way you'll know if you're using the correct form or not, or just go to the website and download another form, it has to state that for these three-day period when calculating days that you exclude Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. It, if it doesn't, or excuse me, not legal holidays, it actually should say judicial holidays. If it doesn't say that, then you got a bad form and you can lose your case. So it used to be that if I served a notice on Friday, Friday would be day zero, Saturday would be day one, Sunday would be day two, and Monday would be day three. You couldn't have the third day fall on a Saturday, Sunday, then they would get an extra day. But now that's all out the window because they need to uh, foister more time for the tenant to rob you of your money. So if you serve a notice on Friday, uh, then the tenant's going to have until Wednesday midnight to pay you the rent. So it's Monday would be day one, Tuesday day two, and Wednesday day three. So they'd have until the end of Wednesday to pay you. Uh, so the end of the day till midnight. Yes, ma'am. No, it only applies to uh, the notices, like a three-day notice, uh, a notice to pay rent or quit, or a notice to perform or quit, okay, which I'll tell you some curious things about that. Um, okay, so we know we're going to use the correct three-day notice form. We're going to get it off the website, which is the AOA website, AOAUSA.com, and they're always the best, and they're always up to date. Because if they weren't, I would smack them, okay? <laughs> See? No, I watch his website very carefully. Uh, and the next thing I want to talk about is the total abuse, total abuse, that your rental agreement says no pets, and magically uh, the guy wants to bring in a giraffe and claims that it's an emotional support animal. And, you know, it's true, it's a giraffe, yeah. It's emotional support. Yeah, I'm going to be able to get him in. I'll have him duck when he's going through the entranceway. Uh, and we all know that they show you some certificate that's out of Oklahoma, and it says Fido is a beautiful emotional support animal. And then you look at it, and you, you know most of the time you're being advised that you have to now accept this giraffe or orangutan or something coming into your unit. Um, and but my but this is a pit bull and my insurance doesn't cover it. it. Do I have to take it? As I get the questions, my insurance is going to cancel. We're not allowed to have a pit bull or a Doberman. And then my response is, well, I guess you need to find another insurance company because you're gonna have to take that. However, 
while every single law in the state of California that is directed towards income property owners is always bad, always bad, uh, they did one law that was back in January of 2022, so a year ago, that finally was in favor of the tenant, excuse me, in favor of the landlord. And what that law says is that you just can't have a phony paper from some guy in Oklahoma that says that the giraffe is a comfort animal, okay? So what does the new requirements? Number one, it has to be, the, there has to be a letter written by a medical professional who has a license, current license, in the state of California. And it has to state that obviously this person has a disability, they don't have to tell you what it is, and therefore needs the services of a comfort animal and orangutan or something. But it has to state that on it. It also has to state that the person was in consultation with the medical professional at least 30 days prior to issuing the certificate. So you just can't go there, get your certificate and walk out the door. So they have to be there at least 30 days. So now if they don't show you these papers, the certificate or letter from this medical professional that doesn't have those facts, you can tell the tenant, look, this is uh, not gonna fly. You're not in accordance with California law and therefore I don't have to allow you to have this comfort animal, so you better get yourself either a new certificate or get rid of the damn dog, one of the two. Okay, uh, any questions on emotional support animals? Yes. Yes. If you get a call that someone is interested in renting or leasing the apartment and they say, I'll give you uh, animal support, uh, would you allow it? Can we still say no? No, because if you say no, you're gonna get sued. Yeah. All right, the, the question was, if somebody calls you up, hey, I want to rent your unit and I have an emotional support animal, can I just say, no, we don't accept that? The answer is you're going to get sued. Yeah, you can. So, and when you get sued, what that means is you're going to have to go to some attorney, not me, and, uh, <laughs> and they're going to charge you like a, I don't know, a $10,000 retainer. They're going to talk about $450 an hour. And by the time you finish the call, you've already spent $450. So you don't want to give the illusion that uh, you're discriminating against emotional support animal because they will get you. Yes, sir? What is uh, an emotional support animal, whether it's an existing tenant or a new applicant, can you increase your deposit? Can you increase the deposit for a new animal or for an existing tenant who's there or somebody new? And the answer is no, because then you're discriminating on, on the basis of an emotional support animal. So you can't, you can't do that. I would say, good, come on down. Let me see that you have the proper deck documentation. Okay. I mean, because that's what you're well, going to have to do. We have many applications that we're considering at this point in time. Well, technically, under the fair housing rules, I like to call them unfair housing rules, you have to take the first applicant that meets your criteria. So based on that, you, have to, you can't say, I'm considering other people, because then they're going to get you. And there's spotters out there, yeah. and they're, they're coming after you for a bunches of reasons, yes? What if they're saying, you go there, uh, Stephen, I asked about the pet, I said, oh, it's just, uh, I'm just watching the pet babysitting, but every time I've gone there, that pet's there. Okay, so that's called lying. <laughs> <laughs> so I would serve a three-day notice to perform or quit, giving him three days to get rid of the pet, and if the pet is still there, and it's really easy to determine if a dog is there. You know how you do that? They bark. They bark. So you knock. Don't hit step on my lines. Okay? I'm, I'm trying to do a show here, and you're stepping on my lines. Yes? I don't. I have it at the office. But uh, just do, do a Google search, emotional support animals, uh, state of California. You'll find it. Oh, I hit a responsive cord with these pets. Yes. I was under the impression you can't charge a deposit or pet rent if it's an emotional support animal. Okay. First of all, there is no such thing as a pet deposit. Get that out of your mind. There's no refrigerated deposit or, or, or garage deposit. It's just a security deposit. You can charge up to two months rent. You can't charge anything additional if they have an emotional support. So if your normal course of conduct is I take a two month security, or I take a one and a half month security, or I take a one, then that you can certainly charge for that. Okay, let's uh, move on. 
So these tenants are going to owe you a bunch of money because they haven't paid in, that would be a month of Sundays, right? Like for the last, I don't know, how many months has it been? From March of 2020, potentially through January of 2023. So what is it? I don't know, 34 months? I don't know, something like that or more. So, and of course, uh, the easiest thing to do would be to go to small claims court to sue for it when you're able to sue for it. And I'll tell you when you're finally going to be able to sue for it. And of course, small claims court is a wonderful remedy because it only costs you $75. If you're really suing for back rent, and I don't mean an eviction case, I mean you're just doing a regular civil lawsuit for money because the guy owes me $120,000, right? He hasn't paid in, a, in how many months? Um, you want to tend to stay away from attorneys. For, I know for my firm, if you were saying, hey, I want to file a civil lawsuit, I'd be charging you $4,500 retainer and $425 an hour, and it doesn't make sense when you can go to small claims court and for about 70 bucks, you don't need to hire an attorney to do that, certainly on an hourly rate. And that's pretty standard for what any attorney is gonna charge you. Uh, but the problem, as most people think, is that small claims court has a jurisdictional limit of $10,000, but the state legislature did open that up. So for COVID rent, for the COVID rent period, it's unlimited. So you can walk into small claims court and sue for $150,000, assuming you have the right to file it, which we'll go into. So let that be known that the um, uh, small claims court is a wonderful remedy and an inexpensive remedy for landlords. Yes. The tenant burned a unit and caused extensive damage. Can I take that to small claims? That has to be a civil lawsuit. That would have to be a civil lawsuit. Uh, hopefully you have insurance, which will take care of that. So, and... Oh, uh, the, the tenant burned a bunch of, um, uh, per burned the unit and caused a lot of damage. Can you go to small claims court? And the answer is uh, no. You wouldn't be able to sue for enough, only $10,000. So you would most likely go with your insurance company. Yes. You can find links to the full presentation on the show notes accompanying this episode at www.theindustryglobal.com.